This is Value Investing. I'm your host, Jun Kim. In this podcast, you'll learn everything related to value investing. Hello, Value Investors. Welcome to episode 33 of Value Investing. Over the last four episodes, I talked about Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch is a mutual fund manager and as the manager of Magellan Fund at Fidelity Investments between 1977 and 1990, Peter Lynch averaged 29.2% annual return, consistently more than doubling the S&P 500 market index, making it the best performing mutual fund in the world. So I wanted to know about Peter Lynch and I purchased a book called Beating the Street. I'll include the link in the show notes in case you want to buy from Amazon. I definitely highly recommend that you read this book in detail. But even if you don't do that, I'll talk all the details during my podcast episodes. For the first three episodes, I talked about his investing golden rules. And in the last episode, I talked about how Peter Lynch identifies undervalued bank opportunities in the stock market. What I'm going to do in this episode is to talk about cyclical stocks. Peter Lynch explained in detail why it is important to understand the existence of cyclical stocks in the market. And it's going to give you a great opportunity for you to find good investment in this sector. So I'm so excited to talk about all these things. But before we get started, let me give you a disclaimer that this podcast is for entertainment purpose only, and it is your responsibility to consult with your investment professional for any investment decisions. And also, five-star review always goes a long way on whichever platform you listen to this podcast. It's going to allow other people to find this podcast easily if you provide reviews and if you are satisfied with this podcast. So, without further ado, why don't we get started? So let's see what are the companies that are in this cyclical stock sector. So cyclical stocks can be found in the industry of aluminum, steels, paper producers, auto manufacturers, chemicals, airlines, chip manufacturers. So there are many industries that can be classified as cyclical. So what does that mean? That means business has its own business cycles, clear business cycles. So if you know when to get in, then you can make money as an investor. And if you don't care about the timing, then you may lose money. And that's what you have to be careful about. So why is it so important to understand cyclical stocks for all value investors? First, you could fall into a value trap if you don't understand cyclicals. Let me just be 100% clear. You could fall into a value trap. So in many cases, a low P-E ratio, price to earning ratio, is regarded as a good thing, but not with cyclicals. So as a value investor, the first thing you probably look at is P-E ratio. And if you look at cyclical stocks and just see very low P-E ratio, you might think of it as really good buy. But that's not the case. When the P ratios of cyclical companies are very low, it's usually a sign that they are at the end of prosperous cycle. When a crowd begins to sell a stock, the price could only go down. And if price goes down, then P ratio is going to go down. Then soon you will see the decline of earnings and the stock price will plummet. So if you don't understand about the business cycles and you just put your money based on P-E ratio, that's a huge mistake when you buy cyclical stocks. When you see P-E ratio, you always have to have some doubt in your mind. And also you need to understand why there's such a low P-E ratio. And if you don't know how to answer that question, you have to pass. Because it's possible that the stock can be categorized as cyclical and can actually go down in its business cycle in the near future. 
buying a cyclical after several years of record earnings and when the P ratio has hit a low point is a proven method for losing half of your money in the short period of time. That's what Peter Lynch said. So that's the first reason why it is so important for you to understand the cyclical stocks in the in the stock market. Let me give you the second reason, which is obvious one. You can make money if you understand cyclical stocks. A high P ratio could be good news for a cyclical. It means that a company is passing through the worst of the business cycle and soon its business will improve their earnings and will exceed the analyst expectations. So cyclical is the game of anticipation. It is hard to make money in these stocks, obviously, but if you have a good understanding in the business cycle and industry, and if you know what kind of indicators that you can look at to understand where you are in your business cycle, then you have a better chance. The principal danger is that you buy too early, then get discouraged and sell. Because price could go down further and further, you have to be patient. You need to have a working knowledge of cyclical industry. And if you're a plumber, for example, who follows the price of copper pipe, then you have a better chance of making money on aluminum companies. Okay, so those are the two reasons why it is important for you to understand cyclical stocks as a value investor. Because even if you don't plan to have cyclical stocks in your portfolio, by mistake, you could include them because for example you see low P ratio and that could be a mistake so at this point why don't I give you two examples that Peter Lynch mentioned in his book related to cyclical stocks the first stock that Peter Lynch mentioned in his book is called Pelpus Dodge Pelpus Dodge was an American mining company And the main commodity that company deals with was copper. Peter Lynch recommended this stock in 1991. And the stock hadn't gone anywhere the entire year. Peter Lynch mentioned in his book that a stock having gone nowhere is not necessarily a reason to avoid it. But it may be a reason to buy more. So that's a small tip that he provided in his book. Peter Lynch said that he learned a few facts about copper that convinced him that it is more valuable commodity than other materials. First, there's a lot of aluminum in the Earth's crust, to be exact, 8%. But copper is scarier than aluminum and it's vanishing asset. That's the first point that he found out. The second point that he found out is that environmental regulations have forced the closing of many of the U.S. smelters. They gave up on smeltering for good. Lastly, Peter Lynch said that the demand is expected to be on the rise in the near future because all the developing nations at that time were trying to install a phone system that requires miles and miles of copper wire. So these are the three facts that Peter Lynch learned about copper and why he was attracted to this commodity. When it comes to valuing cyclical stocks, you have to ask several key questions. And that's what Peter Lynch said. And let's just go one by one and see which one Peter Lynch thinks critical to ask. First, You have to look at the company's balance sheet and see whether the company's balance sheet is strong enough to survive the next downturn. And I think this is not just related to cyclical companies, but for all the companies. But let's just try to understand what are the items that Peter Lynch looks at on the balance sheet. And I think it's going to give you good insight into how this professional manager, money manager, analyzed companies. So there are a couple of steps that Peter Lynch went through to understand the strength of the balance sheet. First, Peter Lynch looked at all interest-bearing short-term and long-term liabilities, such as 
bank loans and corporate bonds that it issued. And second, it took that sum amount and it subtracted cash from there. And once you have that net interest bearing liability, net of cash, you compare that amount against the equity and see how much it has. So in the case of Pell's Dodge, when Peter Lynch was looking at this company, the company had $497 million interest bearing short-term and long-term liabilities. And the company had $161 million cash on its balance sheet. And once you have this figure, Peter Lynch compared that against company's equity, which was $1.68 billion. And if you calculate interest-bearing debt net of cash to equity ratio, it was only 19%. So definitely it was a clearly not candidate for bankruptcy in the near future. So as I mentioned before, this is not just for cyclical stocks, but you can apply this technique for any other stocks. So when you analyze company next time, instead of just looking at total liability to total equity ratio, which is most commonly used by many analysts, my recommendation is to use interest-bearing short-term and long-term liabilities and compare that against total equity after subtracting cash. So it's going to take you maybe two minutes to calculate this ratio, and it's definitely worth it, and it's more accurate way to understand the probability of the company going bankrupt in the near future. Because if you think for a moment, what really get the company into trouble is bank loans or corporate bonds that the company issued. If they cannot really meet the obligations of such securities, the company does not have any option but go bankrupt. But if you look at account payables and other liabilities, for example, deferred tax liabilities and things like that, those are not really important because it's not going to get the company into trouble and it's not as severe as these interest-bearing liabilities. So that's just one takeaway that I got from this point. The second question that Peter Lynch said that we have to ask when it comes to analyzing cyclical stocks is if the firm can maintain the current capital allocation policy. So the way Peter Lynch analyzed this is by looking at operating cash flow and see if it can cover capital expenditure and dividend payouts comfortably. So simply what you can do, and this is also not just applicable for cyclical stocks, but for any other stocks, you can go to cash flow statement of any company and you can easily see operating cash flow by uh, different years and see if company has covered capital expenditure amount and dividend amount comfortably over the last let's say three years and if company has a history of covering these two amounts then the company can maintain its capital allocation policy the reason why Peter Lynch didn't mention share repurchase in this context is that a lot of these companies can easily suspend their share repurchase program and there's no negative consequences of that. But if company keeps paying dividend and all of a sudden it stops dividend payout policy, then there's a significant downside of company's stock. Look at what happened to GE General Electronic when the company cut its dividend by half and now to one cent. And there's significant downside in terms of stock price because there are a lot of investors who are seeking high dividend yield. And once the company stops its dividend and they try to get out all at once, and that has a huge negative impact on the stock price. The bottom line is that company has a lot of flexibility for share purchase, but doesn't really have a lot of flexibility for dividends. And capital expenditure is something that company has to do all the time in order to maintain its operation. 
So I think I've mentioned this one before in previous episodes, but capital expenditure is something the company has to reinvest and it's something that you have to take into account. So let's look at the case for Pelps Dodge Company. In 1990, the cash flow from operation for this company was $633 million. Capital expenditure was $290 million and dividend was paid out for $103 million. So after capital expenditure and dividends, the company was still left with $240 million cash. So definitely company has the flexibility in terms of managing its cash from operation after meeting all these obligations. So capital allocation policy is the second one that Peter Lynch mentioned in his book. The last point that Peter Lynch mentioned is the most important thing, which is about business. The first two points that I just mentioned, um, the first one was about the debt to equity ratio and second is uh, capital allocation policy, whether uh, the company can generate enough cash to meet its obligations. The third one is understand business. So this one is very unique to each industry and each company. The fate of Pelps Dodge was tied to the price of copper. That's what Peter Lynch said. The basic math is as follows. Pelps Dodge produced 1.1 billion pounds of copper a year. So let's assume a penny increase in the price of copper per pound. Just penny increase, very small amount increase. It's going to give an extra $11 million in pre-tax earnings for Pelps Dodge Company. So given that this company had 70 million shares outstanding, the extra $11 million in pre-tax earnings is worth 10 cents a share after taxes. Let's just put it into context. So let's say copper goes up by 50 cents a pound, which is very reasonable scenario given that the copper's price was depressed at that time. The earnings would go up by $5 a share. So it's a simple math that Peter Lynch derived when he was analyzing this company. And you can see this type of basic math analysis by many value investors. Warren Buffett, for example, when, whenever he talks about his investment in Coca-Cola, he always talk about the number of ounces servings a day by Coca-Cola company. And one penny increase is going to lead to certain dollars of pre-tax income and so on and so forth. So this type of basic math can be seen by these legendary value investors and it doesn't require a lot of uh, brain power to do that but it's going to give you a huge insight into how much pricing power the company has on its products peter lynch thought that copper was cheap in 1990 to 91 because of recession and he imagined that it wouldn't be cheap forever so let's just move on to the the company's valuation, and I'm going to tie it back to the basic math that we just did. Pelpus Dodge was a big company and had subsidiaries. So Peter Lynch calculated the intrinsic value of the firm by taking the subsidiary's earnings and apply modest P ratio. For each division, take their earnings and multiply them by genetic P ratio, let's say 8 to 10 P E ratio for a cyclical on average earnings or 3 to 4 on peak earnings. And when he did that, the gold mine operation was worth $5 a share and the other divisions aside from main copper business were worth $10 to $16 a share. Given that the price, stock price was selling for $32 per share, you're getting the copper main business for very little, 
So this is another basic math that Peter Lynch performed. On top of that, if you have big potential for earnings increase, if the copper price recovers, that's what we just discussed. If copper goes up by 50 cents a pound, the earnings per share would go up by $5 a share. So it was a real bargain when Peter Lynch performed his analysis. So a couple of things to point out here, because Peter Lynch used P ratio, simple P ratio, to calculate intrinsic value of subsidiaries of their company. The beauty of using P ratio is to allow you to calculate intrinsic value in a very, very fast manner, back of the envelope calculation. But I think it's as valuable as other intrinsic value calculations such as discounted cash flow analysis. Because if you perform discounted cash flow analysis, then you need a lot of assumptions. And it may discourage you to perform that because it just requires a lot of assumptions, a lot more time. But if you use P ratio, even though it's not perfect because it doesn't incorporate future cash flow assumption, but still it's going to allow you to calculate all this intrinsic value in a very fast manner. The only thing you have to determine is the average earnings and multiply that by whatever P ratio that you think is appropriate for the company. Another thing that I want to point out here is that you need to understand the business in order to perform all these things. Because what Peter Lynch did was to understand how many pounds of copper this company produced a year and simply try to understand how much the company is going to make by incremental price increase in copper. Based on Peter Lynch's calculation, just penny increase in the price of copper per pound produced $11 million pre-tax earnings. So I feel that that's a huge insight. But people may have ignored all these things if they just use some machine learning algorithm or if they are quantitative investors, they wouldn't be able to know all these things. But these are the things that you can derive based on your common sense. So value investors and who do their analysis based on business insight have huge advantages over quantitative traders or quantitative investors because they don't look at the business insights, business understanding. They purely look at certain measures like P ratio. They wouldn't be able to understand this cyclical stocks and so on and so forth. Okay, so that was the analysis for Pelps Dodge. And I just want to quickly touch upon another company that's also in the category of cyclical, which is General Motors. Peter Lynch said that the autos, often misclassified as blue chips, are classic cyclicals. Buy and hold strategy doesn't work here. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to buy auto manufacturers such as General Motors, Ford, and so on and so forth. The sooner or later, we all replace our cars either because we are tired of the old ones or because the car is just not operating safely. Peter Lynch took a big position in the autos in the early 1980s when annual car and truck sales in the US had declined from 15.4 million vehicles in 1977 to 10.5 million vehicles in 1982. In most cases, cars have to pass annual inspection, which is another reason why people have to buy cars once in a while. Eventually, Peter Lynch thought that cars that cannot pass the inspection have to be replaced. So there are two useful indicators that Peter Lynch mentioned to understand the business cycle of auto manufacturers. The first one he mentioned is used car prices. He said that when used car dealers lower their prices, it means that they are having trouble selling cars. And lousy market for used car dealers is even lousier for new car dealers. So when used car prices are on the rise, it's usually a good sign that 
shows good times are ahead for automakers and auto investors. So that was the first thing he mentioned in his book. The second indicator that could potentially show where we are in the business cycle for auto manufacturers is units of pent-up demand. The way Peter Lynch calculates this indicator is by taking the number of cars actually sold and minus number of cars that should have been sold based on demographics and other statistical measures. So the second component is what should be the demand right now. And the first one is the actual numbers. So if you take the difference of between these two numbers, you'll see if there is a pent up demand or if there's more supply. For example, the economy was sluggish from 1980 to 1983. 7 million people who should have bought cars based on the statistical measure had delayed their purchases based on pent-up demand analysis. So that told Peter Lynch that the period could be at the bottom of business cycle and good times are ahead. So I was trying to find out if there's any institution or any analyst calculating this pent-up demand by Peter Lynch method, but I couldn't find it from Google. But what I found is actual number of vehicles sold by year online. So I'm going to include the link in the show notes so that you'll see that the number of vehicles sold in the United States is going up and down, up and down, and it definitely shows cyclicality of the business. Peter Lynch said that timing the auto cycles is the only half the battle. The other half is picking the right company that will gain the most on the upturn. So even if you are right about the industry, right about the cycle, you can lose still money if you're wrong about the company. So you have to perform individual company analysis after understanding business cycle for cyclical companies. But I'm not going to get into the details of individual company analysis here because that's quite common across different types of companies it's just not for cyclical you probably have your own way of doing analysis to find out outstanding companies in a certain industry okay so today we talked about cyclicals by peter lynch and i feel that i learned quite a lot by reading his book beating the street and one good lesson that i got from reading his book related to cyclical stocks is that I just have to be very careful whenever I see a company with very low P ratio. And if you have common sense, you have to know why the market is valuing this company very low compared to earnings. Market knows a lot about these type of companies and sometimes market reacts very in a stupid way but in many cases market assess these companies correctly so the common sense is that whenever you see low p ratio take a step back and think about the reason why the company is selling at uh, such a low price and do your own research it could be the cyclical stock and or it could be the company is about to going bankrupt or there might be some of the reasons why the company has low P ratio and you can find out this information by going through some odd news articles or website or go to a certain company's report but that's quite important in order not to make a mistake to invest your money in a company assuming that the company is going to come back Okay, so that's it for today's episode. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast. And before I end, I just want to remind you that five-star reviews always goes a long way. And just leave comment on whichever platform you listen to this podcast. And I highly appreciate your support. Thank you very much and see you next time.